Joining us on stage, in conversation with Mr. Hugh Masekela, is Stuart Levine. It's an absolutely great pleasure to have two long-time friends, Groot Skinnerbecks, I'm sure. Design and Dava welcomes Hugh and Stuart on stage to speak. I should start by um, saying maybe you should look up in Google some of the facts that you just expressed, because we actually met in 1961. Um, and we met not at the New York School of Music, but we met at nursery school. Our mothers had brought us there um, 50 years ago. And uh, no, it's not true. Hugh had just come from South Africa. <laughs> I was uh, kind of born as a musician, and um, shortly after that time, I decided to um, take on the role of being a producer. And um, through the years, I've produced many, many, many of Hughes records. And I'm sort of know everything that happened after 1961, but he knows a little bit more about where he was before he got to New York. So mm -hmm. I think I'd like to ask you to explain why you came to New York in the first place. I really came to New York originally to see the Empire State Building. <laughs> but uh, after more than 50 years, I've never been in the building even. Now, I've been in the building because of uh, my, uh, my uh, accountant in America <laughs> finally got into Empire State Building. But um, I, I grew up, I mean, I, I grew up from infancy completely bewitched by music. I wish that other things had attacked me, but music attacked me the way um, um, uh, the girl in um, um, uh, The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> the way whatever attacked that girl uh, in The Exorcist. Um, 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 Music attacked me like that from the time I was an, uh, an infant. I grew up in a country that is just oozing with music. At the time, uh, even the traditional music was like overflowing. And um, by the time I was six years old, I was an accomplished classical piano player because my parents tried to get me away from, uh, uh, from the gramophone. And, at, uh, and then when I went to boarding school, my chaplain, Trevor Huddleston, was kicked out of here for being against the apartheid, among other things. And uh, he had the Anglican diocese close down all their missionary schools rather than accept um, an inferior education for Africans. And that was like the last straw for Fulbur. But um, um, being in a lot of problems at, at boarding school, he was sort of like... Um, um, chaplain to a lot of mavericks and, and people who are always in trouble. He called everybody creature. And one time I had the flu and he said, what do you really want to do with your life? And at that time I'd seen a movie about a trumpet player called The Young Man with a Horn with Kirk Douglas, who in the movie wore the most beautiful thread, stood in front of the band, didn't take shit from anybody, played all the, <laughs> played all the solos and always got the girl. <laughs> and, <laughs> But the most, the, mo the most important thing was that Harry James played uh, uh, the soundtrack and he had the most beautiful uh, tone. And then that was it, I had to play the trumpet. So I said, Father, if I can uh, get a trumpet, I won't bother anybody anymore. He said, are you sure? I said, and he got me a trumpet teacher and a trumpet uh, for 15 pounds. And, um, and I started playing, but because I knew the, techni the, 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 the technique of music, you know, and the theory of music, Soon I was playing, and then other boys wanted to be uh, instrumentalists. And uh, in about six months' time, we had like the Huddleston Band, Huddleston Jazz Band, and we were really like the first youth band here. And then when Huddleston was uh, deported to, so, to, the, to the States, I mean to back to England, um, he went past the States, and then one of the um, fathers in his order, the Community of the Resurrection, met Louis Armstrong. He was a friend of Louis Armstrong, so he introduced uh, Louis Armstrong to Huddleston. And Louis Armstrong said, well, we're going to give him some of one of my horns. <laughs> and uh, so he sent us 
one of his trumpets, and at that time Louis Armstrong was on tour uh, in, the, in Africa, but he wasn't allowed to come to South Africa because um, what they called foreign native, people of African origin who were not born here could only come here as indentured servants uh, or migrant labor. So they didn't allow him, but the, his trumpet got us all over every a newspaper and magazine in South Africa, including uh, the Farmers Weekly <laughs> <laughs> and the Fatherland, and, uh, Fatherland, which was the top African paper. So people had never seen uh, black faces uh, in the newspapers that much were all, all over the place. And that's how we were introduced quickly to the, the, the music community. And five of us today are still uh, uh, professional musicians. Um, a lot of the other guys went into academics and so on. But that was it. From then on, I was obsessed with going to America. How to get to America was a whole other thing because um, uh, um, to leave South Africa as an African year to like first have 400 pounds uh, as a guarantee so that you won't uh, be a nuisance to the people where you went to and they can send you back with that 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. They can bring you back here, you would have a, a letter from your pastor, from your primary school, from your kindergarten principal, from uh, um, uh, the, the local priest. I mean, it was just like, so it was impossible, but it was also bugging at Huddleston. Say, get me a scholarship uh, somewhere out there. I got to get out of here because the apartheid machine was also really coming down and the apartheid boot was coming down our necks. And uh, finally, um, in 1960, um, um, I got um, a scholarship through Huddleston from the Guildhall School of Music. And I got my passport just in time, uh, about uh, two months after the Shubville massacre. And I went to England. At the time, I was just like happy to be in England, but um, um, Miriam McGabber was a childhood friend and we'd always uh, had fantasies about going to New York. I just took, taken the States by uh, complete storm. Mm -hmm. And she said, man, you have to come to New York. This is where it is. I'm hanging out with Dizzy. I'm hanging out with Miles. I'm hanging out with Duke. I'm hanging out with Ella. I'm hanging out with Sarah. I'm hanging out. <laughs> and she was throwing, I'm hanging out with Nina. And I said, you know, <laughs> hanging out with Harry. And so, uh, um, she got me, uh, with the help of Harry Belafonte, Dizzy Gillespie, and John Mehegan and other people, a scholarship at the Manhattan uh, School of Music. Well, I met you right then, or very shortly afterward. And to, put, to continue the context of what New York City was like at that time, it was like um, um, there was, that music was going on every night, everywhere. So young musicians like you and myself, and people like us, uh, we aspired to be jazz musicians like those guys. And maybe we were a rung right below that where they were. They were geniuses, as it turns out, because it seems like that period ended. And um, with them, um, the music kind of stopped at that point. And we kind of smelt that coming pretty early, around 1962 or 63. You started to play. And at that time, I think you were aspiring to just to be one of those guys, until those guys told you, play your own shit. Play, play the stuff for the townships, play like what you got. And I think that was the beginning of um, your deter deciding that you were going to um, go back to where you came from and bring that out. And that was why we started um, this long path that we went on to try to introduce South African music um, to the rest of the world. And I can't even begin to tell you how impossible that was at the time. Nobody well, was interested. Stuart, if you remember, I think like um, um, the, the, the apartment that I had that we lived in, 310 West 87, not only became um, a, a destination for jazz musicians, but also South African, uh, the new South African students. But we were trying our best uh, uh, to, to be bebop players. Oh yeah, trying. And um, then I came to you one day, um, I think we'd, uh, we hadn't seen each other for a while. No. I came to you one day and I said, well, all the jazz clubs are closed and like people that uh, we know uh, are all like studying production companies. And why uh, are we, you know, with the uh, experience we have, why are we sitting around trying to play jazz? Exactly. So I said, well, why don't the, the, at the time, I think uh, yeah, the Brazilians 
were coming out. And Stan Getz, who was from the States, played Brazilian music. So I said, why don't you play uh, South African music? <laughs> and um, um, started to like uh, teach you songs. And um, um, I was a saxophone. I am a saxophone player, but I was a saxophone player at that time. And Herb Alpert had just happened with the Tijuana Brass. So the concept was if this Jewish guy can play Mexican music, why can't this Jewish guy play South African music? So we figured that's a hip sort of commercial idea. And the reason we did that was because you had had a little record contract with a pretty good record company, but they wanted you to follow in the, um, the path of Miriam and be like the Miriam McCabe and be like an artiste, you know, kind of um, um, seeing South African music from this sort of cultural um, um, angle, you know, as opposed to what you really wanted to play, where you came from, which was the music of the townships, you know, so... Well, you know, if you remember, we didn't really want to go that way. We I didn't. mean, I wanted, I, I was trying to get into jazz messengers, and everybody was, right. Horace Silver turned me down, turned me down, uh, 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 Les McGann turned me down, and said, man, go, go and play your own shit. And, and I didn't know what the shit was at the time because I, because I'd come there as a jazz musician, and then um, um, everybody and I just said like, so sort of Miriam and Harry, Miriam McCabe and Harry Belafonte like set me also set me down and said, you gotta like figure it out. At that time, I'd learned a whole lot of traditional music from Miriam uh, and her daughter because I was those. <laughs> The, 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 the funny thing is that I was teaching her, I was teaching the daughter English because she only like arrived and she learned, she only knew Zulu. And I was teaching her English through Zulu. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, um, I was uh, trying to learn things that I should have learned in South Africa. So the two of them taught me all uh, Miriam's mother's song because she was a major traditional um, uh, healer. And I think I got my first, uh, uh, um, I got my first material from there. And then I formed a trio, and um, I had to teach them the feel of South African music. So I sang. I, I mean, I you know I was singing everything to them. And every time I sang stuff to them, they'd say, "You got to sing." Now, bebop players don't sing. As you know, they were very cool behind dark glasses. And the prospect of having to sing. At that time, I was married to Miriam McGavin, and she said, if you don't sing, I'm going to leave you. <laughs> and uh, seriously. And then, and then uh, the p piano player, Larry Willis, and uh, the rhythm section, you got to sing, man, otherwise we're not going to play with you. So that's how I really got to sing. And I, I sounded very terrible to myself. But I remember when I... I uh, met Louis Armstrong um, uh, in 1961, before I even started recording, he said to me, you sing? And I said, no, he said, what if you come from Africa, you should sing. If I can sing, anybody can sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so sang, I took a chance there. <laughs> well, we sang, we, we, what we did is um, we took a chance, you know, and we decided, well, you know, we left jazz behind us. We were improvising musicians, but we didn't have to be jazz musicians. When I say we, it was mainly presenting Hugh as an artist. And um, we couldn't get anybody to be interested in what we were talking about. So we finally found a, f a fantastic man named Lee Eastman, who um, um, was a lawyer and a, a publisher and a brilliant music guy. And he um, said to me, what do you want to do? I said, well, we want to present this music. He said, what music? I said, I don't know, you know? <laughs> it's like South African music, some jazz, rhythm and blues, the Beatles had just come in, rock and roll. I don't know what it is, but it's of this moment. We started with uh, the guy from the Bronx playing South African music. Oh, me. Yeah, right. And, um, about that. <laughs> and it was very frustrating because it really wasn't coming through. I mean, it was a, you were a great player. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you were a good player. I was a good player. <laughs> but 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 it wasn't coming No, through. one day I just said to him, we got this wrong, man. You go in there. And for those of you who know the recording studios, there's a glass. You know, I said, you go in there and you play. Let me come in here and I'll be the producer. That's how I became a producer. That was 45 years ago. And I'm still fooling everybody. So, um... <laughs>
But um, we, we were blessed with um, the success of the record business at that time, just to give you a look at how different it was. Um, we had our own little independent label called Chisa, which is a, a word from here. Well, we started it as double O one. It, it. it was a time of uh, James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to show you how en enthusiastic we were, so uh, we were looking for a name. And we couldn't think of the name. It was the time of uh, uh, um, James Bond, so we called uh, our first production company Double O Buana, yeah, Double O Productions, because we figured it had like um, a little touch of um, um, uh, Africa. The lucky break we had is that I think our second record of became like we had a number 33 hit uh, cover of um, Third Dimensions. Um, um, up, up and away. So we made the charts, and after that, uh, we came up with a song well, with the, uh, called Grazing in the Grass. Well, that, that's worth knowing about it, is the, the way Grazing in the Grass came about it is this record company, um, um, we had finished an album, they said we needed to give them one more song, and we right. just thought we'd play, um, there was a little song that Hewitt found when he had come to Zambia, and it was a little 45, and it was called Mr. Bull Number 5. And um, um, it started with a little cowbell and a guitar. Can we do it for and you? he'll sing it, play okay. it for you now. Do you mind if we play it for you? <laughs>
try and build it, your country with those who oppressed you and try and teach them the gift of love and try and learn the gift of forgiveness and try and always remember but never forget and most of all never again in this land will one group of people ever get to dominate another. And um, I think this year, um, um, contrary to uh, the beliefs of the naysayers, the people of South Africa this year, thanks to all the people overseas who put pressure on their governments through the years of apartheid until they really had to like give up. And without you, wherever you are out there, we could never have gotten to the goalpost as soon as we did. And we could never have like, gotten to like places like design in Daba as soon as we did. So we thank you, the people out there. How about a big screen for the The old geezers are all leaving us, and the ones that are still alive are very frail, but we'll always cherish the dreams that they made possible for us to go after. And uh, at this time, I'd like to pay tribute to them. But first, I'd like to thank Rabbi Naidu, uh, who put, to put together a design in the for inviting us today. And uh, thank you, Stuart, my dear friend of um, many, many eons, for coming uh, to help me talk about this. I was terrified to face this audience. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you, as a tribute to the old geezers, and especially to old man Mandela, to stand up and, and shake a little booty for the old geezers. Here we go. Let me see you move. Let me see you move. Let me see those hands. Let me see those hands. Africa. Yeah.